So hello everybody, uh, welcome to this brand new episode of A Conversation with Comi Tan. Uh, you'll be now, by this point, pretty familiar uh, with both my face and the, the gentleman on the other side uh, of the Atlantic, <laughs> um, which is David uh, Matheson, who I've spoken to now uh, about four times. This is the fourth time, I think. Uh, and uh, whenever I get to talk to David, it's, it's always a great conversation. We've got sort of mutual interests in the stars, in religion, philosophy, and all sorts of things. So, um, hi, David. Uh, and uh, how have you been? And, and sort of the first question is, what have you been up to since we last spoke in terms of your sort of ideas, theories, anything new that has emerged in sort of the last year, really? Hi, Kamatan. Thanks for having me on. It's good to be back and see you. And thanks for, you know, circling back and saying the, the cycles of the heavens have gone through another <laughs> turn. So it's time to get back into our conversation. Yes. Um, since we spoke, I've released a couple of online courses. So I've been working on, in addition to all my books, Yes, I've been working on some online courses, and, awesome. and so far I've released a course called the Celestial Bible Tour Part One, and a course called the Celestial Bible Tour Part Two. And so those are projects that I've completed since we last spoke. And I think probably yeah. when we spoke before, I might have been working on. There's a couple of courses that I published before those, which one is called celestial mechanics and the myths yes about all these heavenly cycles and how the myths use these heavenly cycles as a language and yeah. then another kind of foundational course is called recovering our deeper self so it involves the theme of the myths that has to do with we have access to mm. an authentic self a true self but we get separated from that through the vicissitudes of life in this world, but especially through what modern psychologists call psychological trauma, which has to do with suppression of our own self or separation from our own self without our even knowing it. It happens without, yeah. it's, it's something that can happen unconsciously as a defense mechanism that psychologists explain why it happens and how we aren't even aware that it happens. And I'm convinced that the ancient myths yes. are dramatizing that because we're not aware that it happens, they have to show us. In fact, we're even resistant to the idea that it's happened in many cases. We have this defense mechanism that says, oh, oh no, I never went through something like that, you know, as we're suppressing the pain that caused it to happen. So the myths are there to wake us up to that mm. and to point our way towards recovery. So, so far, I get those four courses out and mm. pretty sure when we spoke the previous time, I had not yet released Celestial Bible Tour Parts 1 and Part 2. Each of these are like 11 hours worth of, wow. of video that is, uh, you know, on demand. You can watch it as many times as you want. Yes, that no, that's that's really interesting because I like what you're doing there with with sort of bringing a contemporary application of these ancient ancient stories, these ancient observations of the night sky. I think that's really quite unique, and also you know it, it's it's useful and helpful for people, which is the whole point of of why we talk about these topics. Really, is to is to produce knowledge, but is also to, um, you know, and guide people, essentially. That's what the stars were really there. And, and that's been our relationship with the stars for for sort of millennia, really. Uh, so you're just kind of, you're continuing that tradition, really, but <laughs> re-earthing re re um, these old ancient stories um, to do that, which is fantastic. I really like that idea. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you put that very you put that very well and it is a treasure. Um 
there's a book called Hamlet's Mill, which we may have spoken about before. It's yeah. a very seminal work on a lot of authors, myself included. It was published in 1969, but the two authors, now long deceased, but they were two uh, university professors, Giorgio de Santiana and Hertha von Decken. And somewhere in there, they claim that Aristotle called the ancient myths this ancient treasure. Now, I believe it when they when they quote him, but I haven't actually been able to find that. Maybe some professor who's listening or some expert in uh, you know doing the searches for Aristotle quotations can find where he called them the ancient treasure. Anyway, they they say that he said that. I'm pretty sure uh, they say that in there. But either way, whether Aristotle said it or not, these ancient myths, we can call them myths, we can call them sacred stories. Mm -hmm. In some cultures, they were oral. In most cultures, they were passed down in an oral fashion. In some cultures, there's a deep scriptural tradition, such as the Vedas and the Sanskrit texts of ancient India, the scriptures of the Bible, the, uh, you know, the Greek writings, uh, Homer, attributed to Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey are scriptures. But so I usually say the ancient myths, scriptures and sacred stories are this treasure. It's yeah. like an inheritance, a precious inheritance given to each culture for a reason, not just, you know, for fun, but for an actual reason. Mm -hmm. to, have a, to have a proper purpose, really, to have a proper function. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, I usually put a, a note on my doorbell and I didn't. <laughs> so now my dog is barking in the background. <laughs> <It's> um, okay. <laughs> yeah, my dog is doing a perfect illustration of our defensive, <laughs> some of our defensive uh, yes. <laughs> aspects of our mind that will sometimes jump up and, and you know, defend us even when we don't need to be defended. I don't need to be defended from the postman, but my dog thinks I do. So uh, sorry about sorry about that little interruption, but it's a uh, it's a, a a respect for mm -hmm. these ancient myths that's um they're not just for you know s scholars they mm -hmm. are for our lives they're actually yeah. about us is where i was i was going there yeah. and so i like the way you you put it and i agree they are practical they're not for ancient history mm -hmm. they're for the, this very moment that you and I are living in. Yes. And all, well, one thing, one question that I wanted to sort of pose to you um, was, I was doing a, an event recently and I was giving a lecture and, and one of the questions back to me uh, was, how does astronomy, or, or do you think astronomy has the power to sort of unite people? And I thought that was a really interesting question. Um, and I kind of expanded that question as if to mean astronomy, but also the stars and star myths, just for the purpose of of the topic we're talking about. And I and I re and I the way I answered it was that you know I I actually really do believe that it does have that unifying power that it does that that just because of the physical positions that we are in, you know, we are below the stars in the sense of you know we're looking up at them each night, and and the, there is that sort of that unity that we all have, no matter where you are on the planet, no matter race, religion, nationality, um, the, the stars are for all of us and they are there uh, as a sort of constant in our lives. And that's the way that I sort of described that. But it, I think it is an interesting idea and I wanted to kind of get your, based on the, the work that you've been doing, um, you know, do, do you think that sort of astronomy and of course, you know, the star myths and, and, and sort of these ancient, this ancient wisdom, does it have the power to, to unify us in a world that really seems to be sort of more fragmenting all the time? But, but maybe this is the one thing that we can actually use to, to unite us really. Well, it's a great question. And it's a, I like the way you answered it, that they do unite us. And so, I've thought about this a lot as well. Um, the fact, you know, my work presents 
thousands of pages of evidence, really, that the world's ancient myths, scriptures, and sacred stories are sharing, they're built on a common foundation yes. of celestial metaphor. And so that should unite all of us, mm -hmm. but instead, certain interpreters of the ancient scriptures, in particular, the biblical scriptures are the most you know, it's the most familiar example yeah. because, you you know, you have literalist Christianity going around the world saying to pe people in, let's say, Mongolia, mm. not only are your traditions, you know, n not true, but they're actually yeah. evil. They're mm -hmm. made, you know, they're given by devils or demons. I mean, this mm -hmm. kind of... Um, you know, horrific inversion of what the real situation is, that no, your biblical stories are based on the very same yeah. celestial metaphor foundation as the myths of every other culture. Yeah. So it should unite us. I mean, there are many other things that should unite us, right? We're all, <laughs> we're all actually united. The divisions are... Um, you know, a lie. It's it's a lie to say that those people are not, you know, the same as us or not. We're better than them. That mm -hmm. is a, you know, that everybody knows in their heart that that's a lie. When somebody, you know, turns it around and says they're better than you because of whatever external characteristics. We internally, yeah, we internally rebel against that because we know it's not true. It's a lie. So there's lots of things that should unite us and actually when we're in our you know this this core self that's our authentic self we feel compassion for others mm -hmm. and we do uh realize and and that is actually part of our nature is to be compassionate we're not just this uh you know um competitive tear each other down or we would have never survived you know we we cannot feed ourselves and do everything that we need to do just all by ourselves and that's something i did want to get into i do have a few little visuals prepared for later yeah. you know i didn't know exactly where we were going to go but i just prepared a few stories and examples to touch on but yes it, it unites us but then i did want to bring in the fact that and yet it's amazing, but it's true. I can only report what's actually out there. All the different cultures have superficially different gods and goddesses or myths, and they reflect beautiful aspects of different cultures and different climates. You know, sometimes I compare the myths of ancient India, where the gods and goddesses, when they are, when they are pleased, they'll rain down flowers from the sky in the myths in like Mahabharata. When a human or a mortal does something good and the gods are pleased and goddesses, there's heavenly music and flowers raining down. And I say, you know, now can you ever imagine the Norse gods like Odin and Thor raining flowers down <laughs> on, you know, on Norse uh, heroes? No, they never, they never, rain flowers because well they're up in the north where it's snowy and rocky and mountainous and it's just a totally different feel to those myths or even the Tao of yeah. china you know the ancient Tao. you can call i you can call the divine realm by different names you can say gods and goddesses you can say the infinite realm you can say the Tao. in the Tao, in the book the Tao Te Ching or the, the verses, it says everything unfolds from the Tao and it folds back in, into the Tao. And it's almost an impersonal, you know, it's a, yes. you can't even describe it. It's, it's, it's imminent. It's, it's uh, indescribable. The minute you try and describe it, you're not describing the real Tao anymore. Yes. But all those differences, I'm convinced they are still talking about the same thing. And yet, in different ways that are beautiful, mm -hmm. like I wouldn't want them all to be the same. And so it's not a quote universal religion that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. it, there's a universal foundation that's expressing these universal truths 
with very different kind of clothing on them. It's the same truths underneath. The feeling of, you know, the clothing of ancient China in the Tao or the Buddha is yeah. a different feeling than the Norse myths of Thor and Odin or the, you know, scriptures of the Maya that are yeah. preserved in the Popol Vuh. They all have a very different feel or the Maui stories from the, the islands of the Pacific. And all those cultures have very real differences. And so they have these traditions that are a treasure that are theirs. And so the, the final thing I'll just say about that is the ancients perceived that there were differences, but perceived the similarities. Like there's a Roman writer named Tacitus, or we call him Tacitus in English. In, in Latin, they probably said the C as a K sound like Tacitus, Tacitus. but we turn it and we turn it into Tacitus. You can look him up. You know, his his writings from thousands of years ago are all in the public domain. So you can read his he has a couple that have survived that are famous. And one is called the Germania. And he's talking about the Germans or what the you know what the Romans called the, the Germans in kind of north central Europe that they were fighting against. And Tacitus says, well, they organized themselves into these groupings and this. And then he starts talking about their gods. And he says, well, they have their, their prime god is Mercury. Now, you know, the Germans didn't call Wotan or Odin Mercury. But yeah. Tacitus and the Romans recognized, well, they're talking about, about our god, Mercury. Yeah. Or this one, you know, they'll say, oh, but their prime god when they go into battle is Hercules. Well, it's not Hercules. <laughs> you know, it's it's a German god, but the ancients perceived that they were the same. Even Herodotus does this uh, from ancient Greece. When he's talking about the Egyptians, he'll say, well, you know, Osiris, that's our Dionysus. I mean, you would think, wow, those are really different feeling yeah. uh, cultures, <laughs> Egypt and Greece. We're taught in school, oh, you know, Egypt didn't have human-like gods, only Greece was the first ones to have human-like gods, but the Greeks didn't see any, you know, they didn't say, oh, they're so different. They're so, you know, we have to correct their ways. No, they just said, yes, they call our God Something you know, Zeus, they call Zeus Ammon or whatever. And the ancients had no problem acknowledging the differences and yet also seeing an underlying similarity. So yeah. I think that's a really important kind of perspective on your question yes definitely yeah and i think i'm i'm going to try and explore that idea a little bit more i think in my own writings uh because i think it was a really interesting question and one that i have i have thought about it before but uh maybe not as in depth and when you put on the spot sometimes you sort of have to think of oh right okay <laughs> how can i answer this you know but um you know i think it's really the idea this idea of sort of astronomical astral sort of unity maybe or something like that <clears throat> and um and how that sort of can be applied to the present day woes of individual woes personal woes but also maybe the the global woes that are that are taking place um one thing that that i did want to sort of touch on and and depending on sort of how far we can get into it it'll be up to you i suppose but um when so obviously you spend a lot of time maybe thinking about the stars um obviously reading a lot of ancient sacred texts um but also what i was interested to know from you was when you sort of i don't know how often you go stargazing or or, or that but um do you ever sort of have that inner feeling um of connectedness or purpose or sort of an existential i don't know comfort maybe uh, from sort of observing the night sky it's just because i've asked this of, of different guests and some of them have said yes and and i i felt this and uh, i wanted to sort of get your your view on that do you do you sort of have this inner this inner quality maybe i i feel like it's a quality in certain people that they have this sort of um i don't know this ability to connect to the stars in some way and and have and 
especially now with like space exploration and and the possibilities are endless really um i don't know do you have you ever had that kind of feeling before david after all this sort of time sort of exploring and 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 also maybe as on on top of that do you think perhaps these the sort of ancient writers maybe have that same kind of human feeling is this sort of does this exist in everyone but it just needs to be awakened perhaps i don't know it's just something that's been on my mind because i feel that i that i have some kind of connection to the stars uh i don't know in what capacity yet i don't know but i was just interested to know if you had sort of felt that and maybe that's why you know you'd gone into this or or been interested in sort of these ancient texts perhaps <clears throat> Yeah, well, I like that question. I don't think I've ever been asked exactly that way, uh, <laughs> that question before. So that's a really good one. And I would say the short answer is yes. Yeah. And I would say the, sh the slightly longer answer is everyone. I don't think it's unique to me or you. Um, and what I believe it has to do with is what I referred to a minute ago about connection with self like what we're looking for you know i would definitely describe myself as like a seeker kind of a personality uh throughout my life like this has been a characteristic and i am now reflecting and looking back mm. you know with some perspective of let's say the way i was when i was 20 or 19 like, what was I looking for? Mm. I would answer that that, uh, that thing that we're seeking is our own, our own self, our own authentic self. But it's not just individual. Like, when we're divided from ourself, that I'm going to paraphrase a pioneer, a psychologist pioneer named Dr. Peter Levine, who's a pioneer in trauma the concept of psychological trauma, he says trauma, he's defining it in, in one of his books. The book is actually called Healing Trauma, and you can find this quote, I think it's on page eight or nine, right at the beginning of the book. He says trauma, in short, is a separation from yourself. Mm -hmm. But then he goes on to say, which is a separation from family, separation from other humans, and even a separation from nature. He also throws in a separation from your body. Like when we're separated from ourselves, we're separated from, we actually don't listen to our gut or we carry tension in our teeth or things like that because we're, we're actually divided against ourself. It's like we're, um, and our body will let us know sometimes with, you know, uh, if it can't get our, if we can't, if our self can't get our attention in any other way, it can, uh, speak through the body to get our attention. So, and I would expand that even beyond disconnection from nature to disconnection from the divine or the infinite. Yes. So, awesome. when we reconnect with self, then we can reconnect with others. That compassion that I talked about that is innate in everybody. We yes. do have an innate uh, characteristic of being reconnected with self is curiosity about how others are hurting and compassion to try and help them. Those are innate qualities that we have. But when we're divided against ourselves, then we can wall ourselves off, you know, not only from our own self, but from others and from the divine and from nature. We can disconnect from nature. Yeah. So when we get back in touch with self, that is actually like the, I'm convinced that the myths show that it is through self that we get connection with the infinite. Yes. And so the, the stars are the closest we can see to the infinite. You know, yeah. the infinite is the invisible, the infinite. We can't really see it, but we, see? but it's not, but it's real. Yeah. <laughs> and we can look into the infinite when we go out into the night sky. You are actually gazing into infinity. And yes, it is moving, and I'm sure that's why the myths, which are talking about these matters, including 
what the infinite is, whatever we want to call the infinite, the Tao, the divine, are using the metaphor of the stars. Yeah. And it's profound. And sometimes people object or rebut to what I'm saying by, by saying, well, well, of course the, the myths around the world are based on the stars because everywhere around the world can see the stars. And I say, well, first of all, that's not obvious. <laughs> that, that, no. that it's not obvious that cultures universally around the globe would decide to base their sacred scriptures or sacred stories about the the divine world, the dream time, they call it in Australian Aboriginal yeah. Indigenous society and, and culture, the dream time. Why would every culture choose to use celestial metaphor? That mm -hmm. isn't intuitively obvious. That mm -hmm. is genius. That is brilliant. They're, they're talking about the infinite and they use the canvas of infinity to, to wow. dramatize it for us. And yes, I do believe that when we go out under the stars and I try and do it every night, and I, I suggest that people do it every night. Yeah. It's like a very inexpensive uh, <laughs> inexpensive hobby if you want to get yeah. into something. It costs, costs yeah. less than, uh, you know, taking up skydiving. But um, I do feel that connection with the infinite. Yes. And that connection comes through reconnecting with self. And that's what I feel... Mm. I've been pursuing my whole life is reconnection with self. And I'm not standing here telling people, uh, I am all reconnected with self and I'm always acting from that place of compassion and clarity. These are terms that another psychologist, Dr. Richard Schwartz uses to describe when we're in self, yes. we have this compassion, we have this courage, we have this clarity. I feel that when I'm in that mode, but yep. there are many things that can disrupt it. I'm not pretending that I've achieved some kind of nirvana, but when we're in self, we connect with others, we connect with the universe, we connect with the divine. Yes. Yeah. That, that's really interesting because, you know, I've, I, I see this for me anyway, and and I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm trying to sort of collect these sort of stories together because I have really heard some really amazing experiences from other people, uh, but I can only kind of go off myself in a way and and sort of my experiences. And I don't know, there's just so many functions for the stars in my life. Um, you know, first of all, the, the silence sometimes is, is brilliant. You know, if you can get to a, a proper dark site, I know they are quite hard to come by uh, in today's modern world, but... Um, I would suggest anyone to go to a dark, a proper dark site where um, it's purely uh, there's no or very little light pollution, and um, it, it really until you go to something like that, it, it you really don't grasp how the 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 ability for the universe really to um yeah kind of reconnect you're right you know it's it's kind of that reconnection you know if i feel um upset or if i have a really bad day i'll try and end that day by just looking at the stars actually that's something i do um some people don't get it and i <laughs> i try and sort of explain this to some people and they just really don't get it you know they they wouldn't have that kind of connection and so that just made me wonder you know is this inherent to all people and and maybe there's a way to awaken that in people and that's what i've sort of beginning to think and and sort of how can i do that you know how can i help other people to to sort of awaken this element because it, it's really useful you know when you can go out to the stars and and just sort of have that centeredness and that kind of humility as well. You know, there's, there's that humility about standing in underneath, uh, you know, uh, a, a starscape of, of, sky, of, of, of stars. Uh, and I, I don't know that there's, it makes you very small, obviously. And, and the reality of the universe, um, 
it, it there's something very humbling about that and maybe that's something that is needed more in 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 life but i don't know i think that there are just multiple functions to this and uh, i did actually do a little bit of research and there is a psychologist called william e kelly who um who's been sort of studying this idea of you know the sort of this emotional connection or even a spiritual connection to the stars and he calls it knocked calador which is a really interesting word that he's created um and sort of that will go wherever it goes and the academics will will continue to study that but i think it really is a phenomenon i, I really do i think i think anyone really can engage with the stars on that level I, I but also at the same time and and this is interesting maybe for yourself as well i think that there's diff possibly different levels of of sort of that engagement with the stars i think you know i've meditated under the stars sometimes you know and and i can feel myself reaching higher states you know and so i wonder where how far that could go so i've i've I don't know. I'm, I'm just exploring this right now. You know, it's it's really cool uh, to be able to, I don't know, explore this connection, I, I suppose. Um, like I said, other people, they just don't get it. They're like, come on, what are you talking about? You know, um, but maybe if they sort of read some of your work, maybe they might, you know, the, the work that you've done on the, on the sacred text, maybe then they might understand how, this connection to the stars is is not just something that's emerging now it's it's been there since we've existed essentially hasn't it you know yeah that's a very uh it's a very deep subject mm. i will say that another important aspect of the research that i'm doing another important aspect of what I believe this ancient system is built on is this concept of cycles right uh, the stars and the heavenly bodies if you make a habit of going out every night and where i live i'm fortunate in the location in that i live in a pretty dark area but right. to your point to your point i really like to go out into the desert you know i'm uh, here in the southern part of california which really is a desert i live in a pretty desert area but i'm close to the coast so sometimes we get fog and clouds and things like that from the ocean because uh, i love being near the ocean as well but when i go deeper into the kind of interior there's an event that i do every year with some podcasters where we go to uh two different national parks in utah that have very nice mm. dark skies you know beautiful dark skies bryce canyon one of the darkest yeah. Uh, night skies and zion canyon and then not too long ago i was down in joshua tree which is in a uh, national park in southern california that's actually some pictures of joshua trees back there on the wall yeah. behind me it, it's a <laughs> desert uh you know out in the desert the stars can be so overwhelming in their uh you know the number the number of stars it makes it even hard to pick out the constellations because there's yeah. so many stars whereas usually you're just seeing the brightest ones and i know um you know to come back to the point and i know we have a little time uh the time clock where we're going to switch over to the other yes uh, the other thing but to get back to the point of time if you go out periodically let's say every night mm -hmm. or uh, throughout the year, you will start to notice the motions of not just the stars because they move throughout the year. The background wow. moves throughout the year based on our relationship with the sun as it changes through that annual cycle, but also the cycle of the moon. Yes. The yeah. cycle of the planets. You'll start to see, oh, there's Jupiter. Oh, there's Saturn. Oh, there's Mars. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's Venus. And these turnings give us the cycles and when you talk about meditation mm -hmm. often breath is involved in meditation or focusing we have cycles mm -hmm. you have a heart that is beating and that is actually changing its you know pace mm -hmm. 
Yes. Based on different things that it's doing and perceiving. And even our brain has cycles of, you know, they talk about alpha waves and beta waves. And when you get into this state that monks that have, or people who have, it doesn't matter if you're a monk or not, people who have meditated for, let's say, thousands of hours, yeah. they can actually measure their brain waves and say, wow, look at how fast this experienced meditator gets into an alpha. Well, that's a frequency. Alpha is actually a frequency of brain waves, which means a cycle. It's a time. It's just like the frequency of the moon yeah. you know, is related to the cycles of the tides, the frequencies of breathing, but not just breathing, but our heart and our mind, which are a system. And there's some very interesting work that I'm just starting to explore about the heart brain you know, frequency system and how it interacts with our breath. You know, I'm talking kind of all over the place a little bit. People watching might be saying, what? How is he going to tie this all together? Mm. The myths are talking about the cycles. The cycles impact us. We have a cycle. We're, we're within cycles. These cycles, we interact with them through breath and through language. You know, all the ancient myths and scriptures and sacred stories in cultures almost universally around the world are conveyed in verse. What is verse? Verse is poetry. Poetry is language with a rhythm, language with meter. That's So these ancient myths are about cycles and rhythm and frequency and dance is, you know, when we start to dance, if we're out of you know, tempo, it feels wrong. If we're in, it feels right. And when we're doing music, it can be in or out. So getting into harmony with our own self and with others and with the universe, that's a big part of what it's all about. And so I'm, I hope that all tied together. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yes. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, um yeah it's 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 absolutely fascinating and it's something that hopefully you know i'll be able to explore more as i sort of progress through life i hope <laughs> um and i don't know i, I want to see how far i can sort of push myself in that in that connection to the stars um and also to explore it as much as i can sort of theoretically and intellectually which is um for people who aren't aware um the way that i do that is through my astronism work which is it, it's a philosophy that i've sort of founded but i'm continuing to develop and that's the way that i express uh my ideas is is under that sort of banner really so um that's all i'm doing really as i'm sort of having these experiences i'm and then writing down thoughts ideas because you do you, you get ideas i'm sure you have you know when you've been out in the desert or under the stars and that's when i get some of my most interesting ideas you know they might be a bit crazy but um i don't know they they're they, it, it is a a way of producing knowledge sometimes you know when you're under the stars and and have that sort of quietness in your in your mind if, in, if you know what i mean um one of the questions that i had um really sort of underpins a lot of what you've already been saying in a way but why do, is is maybe we've already touched on this but is it is the reason why star myths and maybe astral religion which is sort of a broader concept really which may include things like astrology you know uh, worship of the stars and things like that are these things so widespread? And you were mentioning this before, you know, about different cultures using the stars as a metaphor. Um, why is this so widespread? Is it because we do have this possibly innate quality, maybe, in ourselves? Is, do you think that's why it is perhaps so widespread? Or is are there other reasons? Is it something that's innate to us? Or is it something... I mean, I presume it's something innate to us. It's something that's internal. Um, or is it something 
external i don't know in in the sense of you know when you were saying before about um there being sort of this metaphor for stars is that something that has been predetermined you know is that something i know these are really difficult questions to answer but um maybe we don't need answers maybe it's just exploring these ideas but um were we meant to to do that is what i'm getting at were, were all these different cultures you know it's not a coincidence it can't be a coincidence that they came across this knowledge and, and produced it and and also that it stayed with us for this long is there some kind of predetermination there is there some kind of predetermined plan of some kind do you think and also does that then answer why these things are so widespread and and sort of really can be seen in every every culture um if it's, it's a difficult question i know <laughs> yeah i like to say i like to say that's an interesting question when i when i say that i mean uh, let me give myself some time to think of a response no I, I would actually say that that's an impossible question to answer definitively but yeah. i've certainly yeah. thought about it so let me i mean there's a lot of questions in there but one of the questions that you asked is why is this so widespread yeah. and you know or sometimes people have put it to me like where did it come from or how yeah. and the answer really is that nobody today can answer that definitively because it is so far back in the past it is it is predating ancient egypt predating ancient india predating ancient mesopotamia because how can i say that because when i look at the gilgamesh cycle the gilgamesh epic those very very early some of them among the most early texts that we have like 3000 bc yeah the events of the story and the characters of the story can be shown i have shown that they're based on the stars i've written you know several chapters in various books showing connections in the gilgamesh epic or the descent there's a goddess named Inanna or Inanna of Sumer, ancient Sumerian. That descent of Inanna, and it's a pattern that plays out over and over. She descends to the underworld. We see that pattern in other cultures around the world too, but it's a very early myth, and it is clearly based on the same celestial system of metaphor. Or the... I, mentioned the Mahabharata and some of the other Sanskrit epics from ancient India or the Vedas, very ancient, or from ancient China, their stories and, and myths, same thing with ancient Japan, are based on this same system and in North America and in Central America and in Australia, very ancient culture, the Australia, uh, you know, modern academics all believe that australia was basically isolated for tens of thousands of years so this is very ancient if their stories are showing evidence of this system which i have argued that you know some of them clearly do then that means this system is very ancient and yet it's worldwide so it's it's already fully formed inside of the ancient egyptian pyramid text let's you yeah. know, say for example and those are very ancient like 2500 bc so if it's already there it's already in the ancient egyptian creation stories i've also talked about those in one of my books is called the ancient worldwide system and i spend a lot of time showing diagrams it's already there at the beginning of the earliest yeah. writings that we can find of egypt of sumer um of india it's already there yeah. so that means it predates those cultures it is likely my most likely working hypothesis is there is some predecessor yes culture of some sort that we can not even really imagine because it's so much earlier than ancient egypt yeah. that you know but we are finding there are some very interesting work being done by researchers you know graham hancock and yeah. john anthony west beginning in the 90s started 
pointing to evidence using archaeology and and you know physical things like the pyramids and the sphinx and also re referring to myths but also there's a, a researcher and friend named ben van kirkwick who has a channel called uncharted x and he ex examines the technology that is evident in some of these blocks and buildings let's say in egypt yeah. where it's quite clear that some kind of a process was being used on those stones that we cannot even explain it is uh, it is likely that some of these stones and buildings and artifacts including very small artifacts with you know incredibly thin but hard stone and perfectly symmetrical you know uh shapes were made by some culture preceding ancient egypt and they inherited it and they revered it and yeah. they spoke about it but they knew it wasn't it was something way more ancient so i am of the opinion right now that the most likely explanation is there was some predecessor culture maybe several times over that was destroyed by some kind of catastrophe mm. such a catastrophe that it was largely forgotten yes but that these different pieces and memories have been preserved all around the world in different ways or given all around the world you know i really don't know it, you know it could be that humans like you said there's something innate or it could be that when we go into a certain trance state we access you know either through yeah either through things like ayahuasca and other you know substances or through drumming through various techniques but when we access that other realm we get information given to us in a similar pattern that, that's also a possibility there's mm -hmm. lots of different possibilities it's a very good question but i do to circle back to what you're talking about with astronism and what you're doing you know i thought about it I don't, i'm in, and i'm not here to criticize or you know ju i'm just interacting but the yeah. universal you know i find a big part of the problem in what has happened in the past is this universal uh you know christianity for instance claiming to be universal and then going around and destroying mm. and stomping on the systems that were given to all these other cultures this this claim to universalism um i am convinced that the truth is there present in all of these different systems and mm. that you can get to that same truth through all those different systems and it's not necessary for them all, to all be the same or to be syncretized into one mm, the yeah. you know uh the the beauty is there in, in in maybe different people will find one path more you know helpful or resonant to them yeah. than others and so it's i think it's wonderful that we have all these different like oh you didn't resonate with that way of explaining it how about this way of explaining it oh that makes it perfectly clear yeah it's it's like this whole if there was an ancient system it's now been broken into all these different it's like an ancient diamond that's been broken into all these different little crystal pieces and they all have their different uh shades and and characteristics and and colors to them and uh i don't know i i uh not to criticize i'm just giving some you know thoughts from the out side um but i did prepare you know i know we've got a kind of a time um but go ahead and keep asking questions and i'll bring in some visuals uh, when it's appropriate yeah no that's interesting um do you, so yeah i mean with with astronism really it, it, i mean it's pretty simple it's just my sort of i i've been born and i and i've sort of i have an intellectual kind of mind and it's sort of I don't know it just sort of came naturally to me to start writing about my observations in the world and how i explain the world and i know that you know i've just i've not been on in this on this planet very long um but um i don't know it's just something that 
it, it's my way of expressing my my views of the world i suppose that's that's all it is i think some people do look at the word and it's a sort of ism word <laughs> and sort of they run opposite to that and i can understand that um but it really all all it is is my um observations my experiences that have been expressed through a system that's all it is it's just a system of ideas um like there have been many many before and you could say do we need another system of ideas um i don't know i think these different systems that have come about have uh, come about for different reasons you know to resonate as you say uh with different people at different times in history and there one of the reasons why i wanted create astronism and continue with that is because i didn't feel like any of the other religions resonated with me very well and they didn't really reflect sort of my what i call a cosmocentric sort of world view uh, which is to have the stars the astronomical phenomena at the very very center of my sort of understanding and uh, my expression of ideas um i didn't really find that in christianity at all and in fact if you look into the history of things that kind of sort of cosmocentric ideas have been suppressed by some of these other religions that 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 have become world religions today um so yeah that that's the reason why i suppose i just didn't feel like any other thing sort of resonated and then what do you do when you don't feel like something else resonates you kind of go your own path you go your own way and sort of <laughs> and and that's where new ideas maybe can be produced um one of the one of the questions i did have though was uh actually about sort of astro theology more specifically actually uh because i really like that book that you did uh, that was that was in relation to astro theology and um Thanks. specifically about the concept of salvation um i keep asking different people about this idea of salvation it's one that is on the top of my mind and i i think i've got a pretty good idea about how you answer this but um just for the viewers you know is there sort of a a an idea of salvation in the astro theologies that you have observed is the sort of this idea and and is it connected to the idea you were talking about earlier where it's sort of trauma it's trauma based is that is that maybe salvation is is that is 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 us do we save ourselves is there some other entity that's going to save us is are there these kind of ideas in astro theology i presume there are because it, they came before sort of the christian ideas of salvation so you would think that maybe there are these kind of ideas <clears throat> yeah great, great interesting again i'll say an interesting question <laughs> so you know you brought in at the end the the christian concept of salvation because when you say that word salvation it's uh, you know it's a loaded term in english just because of the history of look you know when you say quote unquote the west what are you talking about you're really talking about the western roman empire yes you know when the roman empire split but the roman empire had already become literalist christian you know mm -hmm. and i've written about this you know there's a lot of intrigue and a lot of uh very important questions about how did that happen how did this christian faith become the religion first an accepted religion second mm -hmm. the only one you're allowed mm -hmm. and then the empire split or deliberately was split into two and so was the church split yep. in the east and west and so when you talk about the west you're really talking about the western christian church where you know where that dominated which is rome you know which is the roman church that's mm -hmm. the west and today you know in geopolitics we're seeing a, a you know a real a new chapter of the world as you know basically the western roman empire became europe and then 
you know, imposed that literalist Christianity on the rest of Europe, you know, starting with France, you know, there were Druids and there was Druidic uh, culture in France as well as in England and yeah, um, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. Celtic and all those um, impositions of Christianity. And then it went up, up into the northern, you know, what we today call Scandinavia and eventually got to Iceland. And then it branched out into the rest of the world. It's really a world conquering mm -hmm. system. It's a political project mm -hmm. in many ways. And that project that I would argue is a use of these ancient the ancient texts that Christianity is built on are part of the same system. They can be shown to be celestial. Yeah. Jesus is a constellation. Moses is a constellation. And I can show all that. And I have shown all that. And I, I can show it with animation. It's in these courses, mm -hmm. you know, the celestial Bible tour that I have. It's in books that I've written but they were taken literally they were turned into a literal you have to believe in this external historical figure of a divine jesus that will save you and that version of salvation yes is a literalizing of what i argue is a metaphor that all the things that jesus does he is depicting for you what the characteristics of self are. Jesus goes around and heals people. That's what self can do. Self heals those, self is the one that can heal those traumas that cause you to disconnect from self. When you disconnect from, when you disconnect it from self, you actually bury it. You bury it, you suppress it, you bury it. That's why we have all these ancient stories about a god or goddess who goes down into the grave yeah. but they're indestructible no matter what trauma they suffer they come back better than ever yeah. in other words no matter what trauma you've gone through yourself your indestructible self that's what it's being depicted you know jesus can be speared he can be given a crown of thorns he can be put down in the grave but that's that's a picture of what we do to our own authentic indestructible self yes. but the good news is that it's indestructible your self is there and it can heal those traumas and so the characteristics that jesus displays are the same characteristics that buddha displays and guess what the buddha is the same constellation as jesus as krishna it's the same constellation and so in this ancient system there are these figures that depict for us characteristics of self and so when you say salvation today after 2000 years or 1700 years probably more accurate of literalism mm. because i don't believe that christianity quote unquote started 2000 years ago because i don't believe there was a literal jesus who walked around 2000 years ago there right. were all these stories that were intended for esoteric teaching, metaphorical teaching. Yeah. And then a group very consciously and deliberately said, we're going to use this in a literalistic way, and you're going to be taught a literalistic interpretation of them, which is really a misinterpretation of them. And then we're going to force that. We're going to, we're going to actually inflict trauma on you instead of these stories are there to heal trauma. Yeah. But we're going to inflict trauma on you. We're going to tell you about eternal damnation. Mm. That's not, that, that's actually metaphorical in all these stories. That is not about somewhere you go after you die if you didn't believe in Jesus. Yeah. That is a misinterpretation, but it's a trauma, traumatizing one. When someone comes to your door and says, Are you, you know, if you died right now, would you go to heaven or would you be yeah. burned in hell forever, you know, in a very hot fire that you can never get out of? Is it, yeah it's like, there's a part of your brain that goes man uh, yeah i better i better be really sure about this because this sounds serious this is scary it's yeah. a fear inducing misinterpretation so when you say salvation <laughs> the 
with all the 1700 years yeah after this after this literalistic misinterpretation was foisted upon the world it was it was a takeover of the roman empire that happened between about 100 and 300 so by about 300 so we've had about 1700 years of this mm -hmm. literalistic Into use of the word salvation meaning keeping you out of hell forever well that's a total misinterpretation these texts are not really talking about what happens to you after you die or they may be talking a little bit about that but their primary purpose is for right now they're not talking about hell is not a place that you go after you die it's a condition yeah that they're describing what we're in right now it describes certain aspects of this life in the body okay so yeah. is it kind of a big long answer because it's a big it takes a yeah. lot of i understand it takes a lot of explanation for me to prove this i'm just right now i'm just asserting it but i have laid this out in in great yeah. length so salvation i believe has been turned into inverted and stood on its head turned into something that it's not and turned into almost a trauma a traumatic uh concept of avoid you must be eternal saved. damnation yeah and yeah. and so, like you so we like you point out yeah go ahead go ahead do, do we not need to be saved maybe are we are we already in the state of being saved because we can save ourselves you mean we have the tools already we don't need yeah. some sort of external yeah, maybe yeah. Well, that, or... well so so jesus you know the figure of jesus the character of jesus in the scriptures says things like you must be born again so there's an imperative there there's a there's an there's an urging to do something or to uh, uh, experience something or to um grasp something or to feel something and that involves a set the second birth was a way you see it in christianity but you see it all over the myths was a way of describing recovery of self yes. there's a physical birth and there's a recovery of self you know jesus if jesus is a figure of dramatizing higher self second birth is realizing that you have buried your jesus you know, you've buried your higher self you buried your authentic self and you could go through life without realizing that you, it, it would be sad to go through life not always divided from who you really are and always basically a puppet of these defense mechanisms yeah. that th that jump in to protect you from the trauma that caused that 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 trauma that you experienced that caused you to separate from who you are you can be ignorant of that we generally are ignorant of that because it happens without our knowledge it happens yeah. instinctively or by a you know by the way that we're programmed we are programmed in certain types of scenarios to suppress who we are without even knowing that we've done it to to bury that pain yes and yes and and so to become aware of that is important and is what is why we go to therapy or it's why we search for it's why we search for religion it's why we it's why we go to church we, we go to church because we feel this need we're yeah. looking for something yeah. unfortunately we're often given answers that i would argue are not only not helpful but actually unhelpful uh, but the ancient myths <laughs> are actually intended to point us towards that recovery of self and so what does that mean for after you die i have no idea mm -hmm. but i don't think that's their primary purpose yeah i don't think that's their primary purpose although you know they do talk about it a lot of times when they're talking about it though they're actually talking about this life yes. in a metaphorical encoded way so i don't know if i i've asserted a lot there i haven't that's interesting <laughs> backed it all up but i've backed it up elsewhere and yeah and i'm not the first to say all this i'm not the first to say all this 
but, but my my research of the metaphors supports yes supports this interpretation and i suppose as well just to jump on the back of what you've just said about about going to church there um i think that's why i enjoy and maybe get a sort of spiritual philosophical whatever you want to call it connection um or knowledge from the stars by just being by just going out and and being under the stars and spending time there um i'm not having someone tell me anything the the the, the stars are telling me things <laughs> you know in that sense um might sound a bit strange to some people but you know i'm not i'm not going to kind of a sermon or anything like that but i kind of for me that is a religious act to actually go for me personally to go stargazing and to have that enrichment there that that is something i am getting a lot from that um a lot of knowledge a lot of insight but it's it's kind of like natural it's really this is why i'm imploring people to to really try and connect in this way because it is a very it's a very natural sort of knowledge i suppose a awareness um they're not words the sort of feelings you, you could say that, that you get and from um just being under the stars so i don't know i think that's really interesting as well that that maybe <laughs> when people go to church i go stargazing and that's my church maybe uh for me that's that's my sort of spiritual philosophical enrichment that i that i get um and that just works for me and it might not work for everyone but um th there's something about that that gives me the answers that i need um yeah well it, it's it's a really interesting topic to to pick at a little bit or to mm -hmm. poke at a little bit because i do believe that the chanting the singing those are uh, these are ways to connect to connect with self music yeah poetry chanting going out in nature for sure yeah. going out under the stars and if you actually look at a church building you will see that they are imitations of the heavens so a lot of them have domes that dome is a representation of the starry sky and they will be aligned east west and north south they are a uh, you know a architectural reflection of what you just described going out under the stars and in fact you can do some research and find that the doors of many churches particularly catholic churches you know they will be aligned to the sunrise so they always face to the east they will be aligned to the sunrise on a certain day usually the day that corresponds to that saint that that church is named after so there's a certain day that saint right. michael's day the door will be aligned to this the angle of the sun rising on that particular day so they are um you know they reflect the fact that it the the, the scriptures themselves are celestial yes metaphor celestial metaphor has to do with the cycles the cycles are used to right. convey to us these truths about recovery of self and compassion for others and the way we want to behave to live up to our full potential and churches do incorporate yeah hymns and singing i actually i was just reading these are the orphic hymns oh, you know, right. these, these yeah. are uh, you know ancient hymns to different gods and goddesses from ancient greece primarily but hymns are you know a, a form of singing they would they would burn you know at the beginning of these orphic hymns it says well for this god or goddess you want to burn this type of incense before you sing this hymn so it's yeah. putting uh you into a certain state where you can connect with the infinite yeah. so i uh, i think that's what i know that's what people are looking for yes i uh don't i don't you know denigrate it or put it down uh, this this urge is this need that we have is real 
Yeah. And the, uh, the problem is in the literalistic, the literalist, uh, yeah. what I say is when you understand that the myths are based on the stars, you keep all of the good parts, yeah. the bad parts, are the, the only thing that you lose are the exclusivity. Oh, well, Jesus is true. Mm -hmm. And the Bible's true because that's all talking about actual historical beings like Moses yeah. and Jesus and all the other cultures of the world are just, quote unquote, telling stories or even worse, telling stories given by demons, which, you know, what an insult. No, all those stories are designed to teach profound truths, but yeah. they are metaphor. And so you don't lose any of the beauty what you lose is all the problem parts that turns the teaching on its head, turns it upside down. And, and I did want to, I, I know, you know, we've got a bit of a time limit. I did want to share, I wanted to bring it in kind of okay. not just, not just for personal, um, it, it, it applies on a personal level, but it applies on a societal level. So many of our problems in the world have to do with this, um, you know, Yes. Triumphalism. Our, you know, yes. our way is right and, and we, we can do no wrong and we can do whatever we want because, you know, God gave the world to us. And so we can go take the resources of other countries. You know, that's really the, the, the story that had played out. Um, so, so I did prepare a little. Yeah. You uh, should it. You, we've got about five minutes. Five minutes. So I'll yeah. just go very brief. I'll just yeah. show a couple of things here. Let me. Uh, we could also, me... you know, if we put a link to it, if you can put it online yeah, yeah. at some point, or yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, let me share my screen here real quick. So thanks for yeah. uh, thanks. For, you gave me the ability to share a screen. It says five minutes there. So let me do this. I'm going to hit play here. I thought this was a interesting passage. The Odyssey. I always say you could use the Odyssey as your Bible. The Odyssey really functions throughout my life as a scripture that I've gone to since I was a child, really. But Brilliant. since in the interest of time, I'll make it a little quicker. But I'm interacting a little bit with some of the things that I see on your astronism project. You know, you're talking about building ships to the stars or, yes. um, you know, uh, you also talk about kind of shortages and abundance, you know, this concept of shortage and abundance. So I wanted to, I've got a whole presentation here that's kind of long and it won't fit in five minutes, but I, uh -huh. I wanted to start here. He talks about going to the land of the high and mighty Cyclops. This yes. is, you know, one of the most famous parts of the Odyssey where Odysseus on his long voyage home ends up with this uh, running into the Cyclops. And he says about the Cyclops, I just put in the little piece from the previous page. Now I'm starting up at the top. Yeah. Of, this is from book nine. He describes them as lawless brutes. And they don't plant anything with their own hands or plow the soil. Unsown, unplowed, the earth teems with all that they need. Wheat, barley, and vines swelled by the rains of Zeus. So what's going on here is the text in beautiful poetry, by the way, mm -hmm. is describing the riches of the earth that sustain all life as coming from where? Where does all this, this bounty come from? From the gods. It comes from the divine. The, it, they trust so to the everlasting gods, these cyclops, that they don't even have to plant. The rains of Zeus. You know, no corporation sends the rains, or at least I hope that yeah. never becomes, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> something that we have to pay for. That comes from the gods, or you could say it comes from the divine. You could say it comes from God, if you prefer. You could say it comes from the Tao. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it matters what you call it. It comes from the, this invisible, infinite realm, and the text makes that very clear over and over. All the ancient cultures recognize that the gifts of the water and the sea and the trees and the grain and the animals is gifts from the divine realm and most important gift is humans you know all the gifts that are given to men and women those are the gifts that enable us to turn you know trees into ships so he says now he starts to criticize the cyclops though he says they they have no meeting place for counsel no laws either they're lawless no, up on the mountain peaks, they live in arching caverns, each a law unto himself, 
ruling his wives and children, not a care in the world for any neighbor. This is kind of like the hyper individualized, I would call it like, you know, in modern language, hyper libertarian, hey, no government. Uh, it's just each, you know, man rules his family. Uh, it's this uh, kind of parochial, patriarchal, and there's no care for society. And so mm. Odysseus is criticizing this. And then he starts to, he says, they, they don't care for any neighbor. Oh my goodness, we're running out of time. Well, what Look, I've done, David, what I've done yeah, is I've added an extra link. So once okay. because I'd really That's like great. to continue if you've got the yeah. time, because you yeah, have I, 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 I do want to show this a little. Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, we can okay, jump because it, it gets into your question of abundance. Of course, scarcity, yeah. ships. I've and, and here we bring in. Yeah, so we got we got it. Yeah, I've so I'll just talk for you. you know, I'll just yeah. talk for thirty seconds, and then we'll go over there. Yes, yes. So look, look at this line here. He he says, you know, they they could be improving the land, but no, they don't. They they never make it any better, and they mm. they don't even make ships. He says, for the Cyclops have no ships with crimson prows, no shipwrights there to build them good trim craft that could sail them out to foreign ports of call where they could, you know, trade with other men. And, and they don't, they don't have that because they're just, you know, they just are selfish. So, Definitely. you know, it's not just, it's not quote unquote, just about recovering self. Of course, that's at the heart of it, because when we recover self, then we recover community as well. You know, yeah. we, we, we reconnect with others. We reconnect with, when we're disconnected from self, we're disconnected from family, from other human, you know, the wider human family, the family of men and women everywhere. We're disconnected from nature. So what I was, uh, to get back into where we were, Yes. I was talking about the land of the Cyclops and how these lawless brutes, they're not a positive figure, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. They're the cause of all Odysseus's problems is this encounter with the Cyclops because the Cyclops is is devouring other, you know, members of the crew of Odysseus. Odysseus went there to to see if he could trade with the Cyclops. You know, maybe he brought some wine, maybe they could uh give each other gifts but instead the cyclops says yeah the only gift i'll give you is i'll eat you last after i've killed all your other men and eaten them too so the cyclops are lawless brutes they don't follow the laws of god or men they just live off the bounty that the gods provide the gods provide this rain on everybody the bible even says the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike the nature if you want to call it that the Tao. Yes, the gods universally around the world. It was acknowledged that the grain was provided by a god or a goddess. You know, the goddess Ceres, from whom we get the word cereal, was the Roman name for the goddess of the grain. In Greek, it was Demeter. She was a mother goddess, the mother of Persephone. That's where the grain came from. Wine came from Dionysus. So these gifts from the gods, the rain comes from Zeus, as you see right here in this passage. He's the sky god, the thunder god, the rain god. The, the gods provide, actually, Carleton, they provide abundance. So here I am again, I'm interacting a little bit. Yeah. The shortages, you know, you're, you're saying to overcome these shortages, which we all feel, you know, we're living yeah. in a in a world of of um, scarcity problems and scarcities and and homeless people. You know, here in the United States, it's it's horrific the amount of homeless people. You know, just driving home last night, and it, you know, it does get cold in California too, where I am, and seeing people on you know the bench that's supposed to be for catching the bus, and they're going to be there all night. You can see they've got their you know, blankets around them. They're going to be sleeping on a bench. That's what's going on. It, are the gods not providing enough abundance for mm -hmm. humanity? No, that's not the problem. <laughs> that's not the problem. I, I will endeavor to argue that the, the ancient wisdom is showing us that the gods provide in abundance, but we can react to that in different ways. And the Cyclops is choosing the wrong way. 
each a law to himself, this kind of hyper atomized, you know, ruling his wives and his, you know, family. It's like a, uh, just a, uh, not a care in the world for any neighbors. I'm strong, so I don't need to take care of anybody else who may be weaker than me. Ha! Huh? I'm the Cyclops. This is not a positive picture. And then the ultimate insult, you know, from Odysseus, who travels the earth in his ship, is to say they don't build any ships. That mm. you need you need cooperation to build a real ship. You know, Odysseus makes a raft which the waves quickly destroy. But if you want to build a real ship, if you want to go to the stars <laughs> in a starship, the, the modern equivalent of that would be, well, you're not going to just do it by chopping down trees on your own little plot by yourself. Nobody has enough skill to build a ship all by themselves, he's saying. We need, I need the woodworker. I need the, you know, the carpenter. I need the astronomer who knows how to guide by the stars. I need all these division of labor. This is an ancient, uh, you know, almost economic argument going on here. They don't have any shipwrights to build them good trim craft that could sail them out to foreign ports of call. So now I'm going to a modern economist that I like very much who just, this is Michael Hudson, Professor Michael Hudson. He's now in his, uh, you know, 80s. Yes. But you can uh, listen to him on YouTube. This is just a, uh, a, a, a an interview that he was giving a couple days ago. But these are concepts that you know I've been writing about and thinking about and interacting with his work for years. But he really expressed it nicely in this interview just a couple days ago. Um, the same concept that I feel the ancient myths are talking about. He talks about. Uh, in the second paragraph there, Ibn Khaldun, who was an Arab um, philosopher from Tunisia, born in Tunisia, and wrote about societies and economics. And he said, you know, when things get bad, anti-social selfishness, it's in that second paragraph there, he says, the drive for money turns men into the self-seeking libertarian individuals idealized by the Austrian and Chicago school. And he's talking about unrestrained, like just selfishness. Mm. But he really gets into some interesting things down at the, at the bottom. He's actually talking about the forgiveness of debts. Let me see if I underlined anything here. First, he, he says, look, he doesn't call them like the Cyclops. But I'm saying that, but yeah. it's, the, it's the same thing that Odysseus was criticizing. He's saying, we're falling into, we're actually holding up the Cyclops as if some people are holding that up as an ideal. But if you have that, then you won't have ships and yeah. you won't be able to improve on the gifts of nature that the gods or the you know divine realm have given that actually belong to everybody. So he says it'll cause lapsing back into savagery. That's actually what we're seeing going on, he says. And he ties it into debt, which is really interesting. And I know this isn't, you know, now I'm going, I'm going a little beyond. I'm just interacting with your excitement about going to the stars, which yeah. I, which I equate to Odysseus talking about ships, you know, yes. going across the oceans. But yeah. with an, I would say it's, look, we have abundance here on earth. It's not scarcity on earth that needs we we go we go to the stars to to improve the abundance like you know Odysseus is saying look the cyclops they can live just fine off the gifts of nature right yes but but they're living in a savage brutal way that could be so much better if they would cooperate they could take care of the weaker members of society they could do things like build ships then they could trade then there could be but yeah. if we lapse back into savagery and so actually Professor Hudson ties into this concept of annulling the debts on an economy-wide scale, and he argues that that was in all the myths. He even has a book called And Forgive Them Their Debts, which is obviously from the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Or, yeah. you know, It's a debt, an argument of forgiving debts. He says that was in Mesopotamia. 
You can look at Hammurabi's code. Mm. Hammurabi canceled the debts periodically. In fact, all societies used to cancel the debts periodically. It was only, he says, the Greeks and the Romans in later times said, ah, no, we don't need to cancel the debts anymore. Instead of canceling the debts, why don't we just take those resources? Mm. And, and he says, look at Western civilization that has turned into almost a hyper uh, rapacious savagery but you can use debts to take other if someone has a field that you want let's say and you loan them the money and they can't pay you back because there's a covid or there's a there's a plague or there's locusts that eats all the and yes. you say hey where's my payment and they say oh we had a bad year there was a war you know we got invaded by the assyrians or whatever and you say well tough for you i guess mm. you can't pay then i get your field and the Bible talks about this, you know, people amassing other people's fields by, you know, uh, um, uh, seizing them using debts instead of forgiving their debts when there's a catastrophe. And the ancient systems of the world, the ancient myths all talk about forgiving the debts. And Michael Hudson says, this is what when we he's actually got a book coming out called The End or The Destruction of Antiquity or something like that. He says, when we got away from the ancient ways, we let like the the almost like the Cyclops mentality take over. What's what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine if I can get it yeah. instead of operating under the laws. And he says what the ancients for thousands of years understood was the need for a wise public authority to override the workings of the free market. So I know I'm getting into some kind of economic stuff here but the ancient myths are about this and it has to do with scarcity and abundance i'm not saying oh we need you know communism i'm not arguing for that he's arguing that you need something to restrain oligarchy that takes over everybody you know that yes. that can't without there's nothing stronger than like the banks other than the government if you just say have no government, then guess what? The people who loan you the money yeah. will be the they'll run the government. They'll run the they'll run society. So what we see going on, even right now, I would argue that much of the rest of the world is saying to the West, you have been stealing our resources for centuries. Mm. And and Russia has a, a central authority that's saying, I feel that the West wants to take all of our resources and we're not going to allow that. That's what's going on right now. And China is saying, we don't want our resources to be taken by this system. And we're going to, it really comes down to the credit function. What he's talking about here, he's arguing that the debt function was central to the ancient myths and is central to, um, taking property so the ancients actually argued or put that in the hands of a wise central authority that actually was uh, the palace but also the temple the the monies were coined in the temples yeah. so i've got another economist here I'm, I'm showing kind of some of my economic um proclivities like these are the figures that I think people should study. These are by no means the mainstream voices. These guys are arguing against a little bit of yeah. the... Mainstream. Look at this first sentence from Warren Mosler. There's a picture of Warren Mosler, and you can go look at his YouTube. Mm -hmm. In the midst of great abundance, our leaders promote privation. So this is an interesting yeah. echo of what I just said. It's not that we don't have enough gifts from the gods. The Cyclops could live off the reins of Zeus, you know, that were sent by the gods. And the, the, but we could have so much more if we do it the right way. There yeah. is abundance, but privation is actually caused by going the wrong way. And and Warren Mosler is the basically one of the founding thinkers of what's called modern monetary theory. But he talks about like where does money come from? What is money? 
Mm. And I, I, I don't, I'm now I, I don't want to get into, you know, giving too much of a lecture, but look at ancient coins. What was on all the ancient coins? Gods and goddesses. This is a goddess. Yeah. This is the goddess Nike. That's an ancient coin. Wow. That's from about 323 BC. Here's uh, the goddess Athena from 450 BC on a coin. So somehow the gods are connected with the economy and with abundance and mm -hmm. with the resources. And that wise central authority, the issuers were recognizing that the coins are related to this concept of all the resources of a land come from the gods. Yeah. The the money function is so important. The credit I don't you know I don't want to go into a big long economics lecture, but <laughs> the argument is that mm -hmm. actually, if the central government is the issuer of credit, yes, the central government can forgive that credit. Yes, in time of war or time of plague, and say, okay, all debts are forgiven. And ancient systems had that; they called it the jubilee, or in in uh, ancient Mesopotamia, Professor Hudson says they called it andararum, which was a Mesopotamian word that meant the forgiveness of all the debts. Because, but if the debts are private, like a bank, a bank can't go around just forgiving all its debts. Yes. without going out of business because it's a private company yes so so banks have to be uh under the and they are closely connected with the central money issuing authority but that central money issuing authority has to restrain them because credit is so powerful you have to be able to forgive it or it'll tear your society apart and so that's that's why we have uh scarcity is because of we are We've rejected the ancient wisdom. I, I don't know if this argument is making, yeah, uh, yes. making sense. Here's just one more example. Here's uh, Poseidon on a uh, in, in, from 320 BC. You can even look up our word money. Apparently, mm -hmm. comes from a goddess in ancient Rome, Roman goddess Juno, who was the wife of Jupiter. Corresponds mm -hmm. to Hera of ancient Greece. There was a a temple of Juno called Juno Moneta, Moneta. And that's where they coined the money. And you can look up and find coins with the goddess Juno on the coin. And they coined it. And it says Moneta. It means the one, like the one, the one goddess, Mon, you know, the Mon. Yes. Or the, uh, yep. She's the guardian goddess. And so Moneta, our word money, and even our word mint, for minting coins come from Moneta, the goddess Juno. So th these these uh, these ancient myths are about resources as well as about they're about having harmony within our own self, you know, reconnecting with self. But they're also having harmony in society and in the world. And I would say that a lot of the disharmony. Uh, has to do with taking resources that are gifts of the gods and privatizing those, or you know, oligarchs getting control of those. So I don't know if you want to respond to that. I have a little story to finish off with, but maybe we could just. I've talked a lot. No, no, it's interesting. No, I, I like this idea of looking at it from that sort of economic point of view, uh, which is something that I've, I've actually have begun to think about, especially regarding space exploration. Um, I think. Well, the word that I use and the sort of currency that the, the, the sort of is at the basis of astronism really is this idea of scope or um, opportunity, um, which sort of floods into everything. And it's sort of the it's sort of my equivalent of grace, really, that Christianity uses the idea of grace. And then there's which is obviously divine favor. But then I, I sort of, the way I see it is that we have opportunities and, you know, we can let opportunities go by or we can harness those opportunities and it's up to us really to do that or not. And so I apply that to space exploration. We don't have to go into space. We don't, there's no one saying to us, you know, if we don't go into space, then, I mean, I, I mean, I do think if we don't go into space that 
maybe eventually we might go extinct. Um, but there's no sort of there's no reason for us to go into space other than to um, understand ourselves better and to possibly discover knowledge that would otherwise be that we would otherwise be ignorant to um, if we didn't go into outer space and maybe explore the worlds. Um, maybe that's for another another talk, but I think that it's really helpful, and I'm glad you brought that up, the economic side, is to look at it from, from that side. And um, also that idea of scarcity as well, I think is interesting. Um, and it's something that I'm going to, I'm going to think about and <laughs> hopefully maybe incorporate that into some of my ideas and writings, I think. Um, so thanks for, for bringing that up, Dave. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I like the way I like all the things that you said, and I, uh, agree with those concepts. You know, we are given these gifts. Yes. By the gods, or if, if you want to say by God, by nature, yeah. by wherever they come from, you know, if you have children, you know, they come with different gifts that, you know, you can't take credit for. It's like, where did that come from? Yeah. And, you know, the, the, each, each man and woman has these amazing gifts that are different in all of us. Yeah, those are the most precious resources of all. But all these resources are very clearly shown to be given by the gods in the ancient myths, including the gifts that men and women have are are shown to be given from the gods or depicted as you know in all these stories where, let's say, uh, you know, there's a, a young woman who decides to have a weaving contest against the goddess Athena, and it's like. Mm you know, it's a famous story, Arachne, and um, it's showing that, look, where did you, where do you think you even got that gift from? You got it from the goddess of yeah. weaving and crafts. So don't put yourself above the mm. source, the source, you know, how wrong you are to forget that that's where you got that gift from. You got that gift from the gods. Yeah. Um, you know, how you envision the gods, we don't need to get into all that right now, but it's, we're given these, and it's wrong to waste the yes. resources and gifts of the gods or to um, to squander them and not uh, use them to the benefit of others or to, you know, there is no need for people to be starving in this world with all the abundance that we've been given. And yet people are starving. What is wrong? Well, we've got to get our, we've got to get our, you know, I mean, we've got to get our society. And in, in, I think ultimately we are limited. I think ultimately uh, we are, we have so much potential, but we are limited in what we can do in, you know, physically, mentally, we are limited. You know, why can't I be talking to you and also be doing something else at the same time or talking to someone else at the same time? It's because I can only, I've only got one brain and I can only devote that amount of time to you. Do you know what I mean? So we are, we are limited in everything we do. You know, we can't get away from that. It's sort of a very strong sort of pressure down on us that we can't, you know, disease. You know, that that is an example of our, of our limitations. Uh, but we shouldn't be, the point of my philosophy is that we shouldn't just sort of take that line down, oh, we're limited, uh, you know, we're hopeless. It's not hopeless. We just have to harness those opportunities that we have um identifying those opportunities and then also having the um <laughs> the energy and um i don't know motivation to harness those is is the key i think because that's what we humans seem to be really bad at is um we we seem to be bad at procrastinating and um maybe not harnessing those opportunities you know when we walk past someone like you were saying earlier you know someone who's homeless you know how many other people drove past and didn't even think about that that person you know or did, and, and how many people actually got out of the car and tried to help them you know how what percentage of people maybe did that or would even think to do that so there's all these opportunities that i see that are just passing us by all day every day and the vast majority of them we don't take um 
that seems to be the the reality that <laughs> that exists around us but um, that's the whole point of maybe us having potential you know we have we have the potential maybe to get better <laughs> um but but just um give us th that final story you were just about to say and then we can yeah yeah and then we'll then we'll wrap up so yes i think that's it's, it's, it's a point well taken that you just raised that we are limited you know there's finite which means having a limit or a, a fit in a boundary yeah and there's infinite and I would argue that the ancient myths are depicting us in this life that we're in as an intersection of those two. Mm. We, we are, are finite beings, but we do have a spark of the infinite. And so we have a connection to the infinite. That is the, that's like the leak in your system where you, you're quite accurate. Nobody can argue with you that we have limits. <laughs> I've got one brain that has this much bandwidth at this much. Uh, and I live in a human body that is, you know, frail and subject to limits and all kinds of things. Um, and yet we have this, you know, it's like the hole in the Navajo rug that is the, the leak to the infinite, the, yeah. The, or the intersection of those two circles in the vesica, you know, that some people call the Venn diagram. It's uh, it's finite and infinite, and we are in that space of the overlap. Interesting. And so that the myths are the place where the, you know, the infinite comes down and gives us this wisdom from the, or they depict it. So, yeah, that story, let me just finish up with a, uh, it's fun to, to share a little story here let let me just show <laughs> this is um this is from a book i grew up with when i was a child it's dolaire's book of greek myths and you can see a picture of my copy over there on the left that's not even that's not even my copy that i grew up with like that <laughs> one's in even worse shape this is the one i bought later when my kids were born oh wow. <laughs> so, so this is like the second one but anyway in this book a wonderful book about the greek myths by Ingrid and Edgar Perrin Dolaire, they talk about this in episode where two gods both favored a certain city, and they both wanted that city to be kind of uh, looking up to th them as the patron divinity of that city. Yeah. And it was Poseidon, and it was Athena. And so they argued over it and they finally said look why don't we both give a gift to that city and whoever gives the better gift judged by the people of that city so we're going to give gifts we're going to bestow resources from the gods and the people will decide which is the most you know bountiful and then they'll choose and so it says here in their retelling leading a procession of citizens the two gods mounted the acropolis so we can already tell which city we're talking about here. The flat-topped rock that crowned the city. Poseidon, the god of the ocean and earthquakes, struck the cliff with his trident, and a spring welled up. The people marveled, but the water was as salty as the sea that Poseidon ruled, so not very useful. You know, nice, beautiful fountain, but salt water. Then Athena gave the city her gift. She planted an olive tree in a crevice on the rock. And you can still go to the Acropolis and they have like sacred olive trees and they'll say, oh, this is the spot, you know, this isn't the exact olive tree that she planted, but it's descended from the olive tree that she planted. <laughs> it was the first olive tree that people had ever seen. Athena's gift was judged the better of the two for it gave food, oil, and wood. So all these gifts in one tree and the city was hers. From her beautiful temple on top of the Acropolis, Athena watched over Athens, her city, with the wise owl, her bird on her shoulder, and under her leadership, the Athenians grew famous for their arts and crafts. So, the gods give gifts. Yes. And this is the, you know, the point of the story is that they are, they are the ones who give gifts to men and women. And I found this ancient vase, I know we, we have to finish up, but... Yeah. This actually shows it. There's, um, it's from around 400 BC, and scholars say, well, this is a depiction of that contest. There's Athena on the left. She has her distinctive shield, carrying a spear, flowing helmet, 
And then on the right, we have Poseidon. And so they're both competing. We don't know who the figure in the middle is, but right. scholars believe, well, maybe that's a personification of the Attic Peninsula or Athens, you know, as a beautiful woman who is judging between the gifts. Gods are bestowing gifts and she has to judge. And then I show that these are actually celestial. It's all celestial metaphor. Yes. We don't need to get into it too much. This is a picture of um, the goddess uh, Aphrodite seducing um, Adonis, the story of Venus and Adonis, or that Shakespeare wrote about, or Aphrodite and Adonis. But notice how she's kind of pulling her yeah. garment off her shoulder. We saw that in this in this other uh, vase as well, and that I've argued relates to specific constellations. So it's all it's all celestial. And oh. see how she's pulling her, her garment off her shoulder there. Yes, yes. So that gives us hints as to what we're talking about in the sky, and I argue. You know that we're talking about this region of the sky that has to do with these gods and goddesses and the connection with the infinite this is the part of the sky that has to do with the connection with the infinite so i'll just i'll stop there i i could show how you know athena relates to this constellation in poseidon but i think it's just enough to yeah. explain the resources that we have yes we're limited in our resources except and we're, and we're limited in the human resources too. There's only 330 million people in America. There's only, I don't know what, 80 million people in England or wh whatever the numbers are. There's a limited number. Yes. And yet, and yet, each of those people, men and women and children, has this little spark mm -hmm. yeah. that's infinite. So that's the one point of yeah. the resources that where infinity sneaks in. Yes. Or the finite ends and so with those with those kind of big thoughts maybe they relate into what your yeah. project is doing I, yeah i really appreciate the chance to talk about these things because uh, i think they're so important to where we are yeah and i think it, it sort of requires this amount of time to sort of go in that deep and i really yeah. it's been i think it's been my favorite conversation that we've had <laughs> you know, because we've really managed to just go into so many different things and we've explored so many different i think people will really like this today so um hopefully we can do this again david i hope um at some point um <clears throat> you know or I, i'm sure you'll send me the website link for you and send me any other links that that you think people might you know benefit from from re in relation to what we've talked about today if you can and um Thanks for for speaking to me today. It's been really interesting, and hopefully, the next time we speak, we'll have progressed further, and you know, in our understanding, and we'll be able to engage again with these different ideas because it really is very helpful um, for me, especially um, as a young, little <laughs> <laughs> young philosopher of, of sorts. So, yeah, thanks very much for your wisdom as well. It's always very much appreciated. So. And I'm sure we'll keep in contact. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for those kind words. I'm glad that it was positive. Definitely. Uh, and I hope it's positive to all the listeners. You know, I always say, take the positive parts. If there was parts that <laughs> you felt negative, then just keep the positive parts and, and share it with others who it might be positive for. So Definitely. thanks very much today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks, David. Okay, so I'll speak to you soon. And goodbye, everybody, as well. And hopefully at some point we'll see each other again. Thanks, David.